stuff. So last, last week, Brad was like ADD off the charts, okay? And I told him, like, last night, I was like, hey, we need to reel it in probably a little bit today. And he said, you know what? Without me, Misty, you would put everybody to sleep. That's exactly <laughs> what you said. Like, college professor. Yeah, I said you'd be a college professor. Everybody would be asleep. It'd be boring. <laughs> So we find some balance on the stage. I said, I said, there's going to be a day you thank God for ADD and me. I do, babe. Okay. All right, take all right, it. All right, it's all going to be good. So uh, we are reversing the curse of comparison. Oh, oh I want to say something else. If somebody, if, some, if, if you were escorted to the building by umbrella, would you raise your hand this morning? C. What's that? Weather alert. Weather alert. It's going to be fine. So, right, we have enough emergency personnel, like workers in this building. We're safe. It's like the tornado <laughs> sirens. We can't hear them from Grove. All right, it's all good. We're good. We're going to be fine. Okay, listen. Uh, so, if you were escorted by Umbrella this morning, that means we have some rock star volunteers right. in our parking lots. That's right. And this you know what? They were awesome. smiling. I they passed were. them. As I'm like, I prepped my team in this room who wasn't even leaving, okay? The creative team in this room that I huddled with, they weren't going to go out in the rain other than me. And I was like, guys, we have to have a good attitude, whether you like the rain or not. We smile through it. And then I go out the doors to our guys who are really out there guys serving in the guys rain. And guys gal. and gal. And they are like smiling super big. I'm like, no. you guys are amazing. I asked the gal. Yes. I said, do you want a poncho or something? You're just wearing a t-shirt and a vest. She said, I'm good. <laughs> Look, She's a tough girl yeah, right there. You so rock. so awesome. I'm so thankful for these volunteers awesome. and for you guys being here this morning. Okay, we're going to have a great time. This is the final message in this series. We're reversing the curse of comparison. Week one, we were dealing with discontentment. Week two, deflating the pressures to impress. Week three last week, destroying the silent killer pride, where we got a lot of feedback on that one. They said, don't ever preach that again. <laughs> so I'm sorry everybody got hurt, but I'll tell you like I tell everybody, God smokes us first, and then we just come and share the leftover remnant parts of us getting beat up and battered. We just share it with you. So trust me, it hits us first in our hearts, and then we have to pray through and then share it with you. All right, so today, I am really sorry in advance. <laughs> I'm just going to apologize because this is going to hit some of you way harder than others. Uh, but today, we are going to defeat the inner critic. Because some of us, I'm sure not all of us, but some of us can be very critical. All right? Because sometimes, as we talked about last week, pride does have a way of creeping into our lives. So we're going to deal, and, and criticism stems from pride. And we're going to deal with it today. But before we do that... We're going to do a little announcement for next week. We're going to have a baptism bash, and we are excited Not about, bad. we, we so love excited. doing these baptisms because, you know, this church, um, our, we, we, this church, like, like, like the earth revolves on its, on its axis, this church turns for souls for God's kingdom. We, we are all about seeing people come to Christ and make heaven their home, and we are so privileged and blessed to see just about every week there, there are people, you want to take care of that? There are people, there are people. It was you! It was me! No, it was everybody. That's the first time mine did that for some reason. I don't know. But uh, what was I saying? Oh, we exist to lead people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. And it's so awesome that just about every week we see people come to Christ. And so when we do these baptisms, we are offering you your next step opportunity to go public with your faith and to show the world, you know what? I, I haven't just made this inner uh, private decision to follow Christ, but I'm letting everybody know that I'm a new creation. I'm born again. I'm going to live for him. And I don't care who knows about it. I'm just going to live it out loud and proud. So if you know of anybody that has given their life to Christ or you yourself have given your life to Christ, but you've not been baptized, I feel like Nacho Libre. Oh, when I say you, you why have you not been baptized? <laughs> because I haven't got around to it, okay? Why are you always judging me, right? <sighs> Love that. That's the best part of the whole, the whole movie's stupid. But that part right there. And the recreational pants. I'm not going to do the pose, but the recreational pants is pretty funny. So anyway, <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Baptism. 
You should be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, you should be baptized next Sunday. It's going to be incredible. You should invite all your friends and family, and we'll video it, and it's going to be great, and we're going to celebrate big time. But we're going to do it a little bit different this time. We're, we're, you want to tell about it? Sure. Just so, mix it up, because I can say it, but you could say it too. Absolutely. So it's summertime, and there's a lot of people on vacation. At the same time, we've gone to four services. So rather than having every single service spreading all the people out that we're going to baptize, we're going to baptize at the end of fourth this time. All right? So if you've never been to fourth, mix it up a little bit. Hang out for the day or come back in the afternoon. But we're going to baptize in the fourth service next week. All right? So I'm pumped. Come back next week. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be a different way to baptize. I love it. Okay. Anything else? That's it. All right, go. Gosh. <laughs> Today is going to be so awesome. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to push past all the fluff, and we're just going to start talking about critical spirits. We are. And we're, just gonna, we're just going to dig in. And y'all are going to be like, <laughs> amen. Yeah, that's probably, <laughs> you're probably not going to last me. past this point right here, all, all right. right? Let's do it. So Let's just make it hurt. You quick. know, when you, when you deal with comparison, part of the thing that happens when you are comparing yourself to someone else and you're scrolling through Facebook and you're seeing what somebody else just bought, they just bought that new car just yesterday. I mean, like I'm studying and I'm preparing. At one point we're like driving, I click on Facebook and somebody gets a brand new vehicle, the one I would love to have. No joke. Okay. Now I don't want it because I'm not in a position for that vehicle right now, but they are. So that's awesome. But what tends to happen is as soon as you see that, you're like, oh, man, you know what? I'm sure they had to go in debt, like massively to get a hold of that. You know what? I don't want that. That's not what I wanted. I have made a vow of poverty. You know what I'm saying? And you immediately, you immediately start this comparison. And then it goes into this pity party, this woe is me. And you're the only one that was invited. And you were the only one there. Nobody wants to celebrate at your pity party, you know? But you sit there and you tell yourself why you are where you are and why (laughs) they have made a very poor decision on their part. But you know what is really happening in that moment is that you're allowing that critical spirit that's down inside of all of us to just rage its ugly little head. Honey, have you ever had a problem? Just random survey question. Have you ever had an issue with being critical? No, never. (laughs) Because I have a halo above my head. (laughs) No, I'll be honest. (laughs) It is storming outside. That's probably not such a good (laughs) idea. I mean, it's already here. I I know, right? You know, honestly, I grew up in the church. Did you hear that? I did. It's because you lied. Sorry, Lord. It's because you lied. Now, I grew up in the church, and so before I was ever born, I was there. You know, I was there Sunday mornings, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, whenever the doors were open, mowing the lawn, picking up the trash, cleaning the toilets when we didn't want to. Like, that was my life, all right? So I got to see church and godly relationships from a different perspective. Some of you guys had that perspective as well. Some of you have it now. Well, having seen all of that, sometimes you would get to that pity party status. All right? So rather than having a, the right attitude as a young kid growing up in the church, I would be ticked off that I was the one push mowing an acre and a half because where were the adults who didn't want to come out and serve Jesus? You know what I'm saying? Dad and all of his children were there. And so it led me to this point of having a very critical spirit. And so I grew up with this, this stigma in my mind of criticizing. And even though I have a big mouth, I didn't much say it to other people because I knew better because dad taught me whatever you say, you're going to have to apologize for. And I don't like saying, I'm sorry. We talked about that last week. That's a pride issue. But you know, I learned it, but it was always here. And what begins to happen when you criticize in your mind is it causes you to have such a negative spirit. It causes you to be so negative and it causes you to be miserable on the inside. And it's something that we all have to fight against. Now I can tell you this. The older I got, as I hit my teenage years, my dad was always just saying, the problem is you. The problem is you. It's not them. Because I would come home and say, you know, why can't they do this, this, and this? You know, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to do that. They don't know how to do that. And it was me criticizing other people from my coaches to my teammates to the church to my teachers to my friends. But not just people, situations. Situations. The way things are. And it took me a long time until God began to deal with me and he said, It's you. It's not them. It's not your circumstances. It's you. 
And you know, that's a hard place to be because when God says that's you, you got to make a decision. I can live with the way that I'm being or I can start to change. I can miserable. ask God to change. And so today we're speaking, or I'm speaking, from a place of real understanding with this. You know, my story is not one of going out and being crazy wild. That's not what I did. This was my greatest challenge and my greatest sin. And you may say, oh, well, that was it. Mm, it's horrible. It really is horrible. And so today we're going to teach you how to overcome a critical spirit. I want you to go this morning to Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 through 10. And we're going to take a look at how God really feels about critical spirits. It's not good. We're going to start in verse 1 and it says this. Well, let me back up. Let me tell you what's going on right here. This is the children of Israel. They came out of Egypt. They have been led by Moses, who is their mighty leader that has brought them out. And now they are out in um, the wilderness. They're in Hezroth. And Miriam and Aaron have kind of become very frustrated at Moses. All right, this is where we pick up. Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses. Everybody say criticized. Miriam and Aaron were brothers and sisters to Moses, all right? Now, you'd think God would take it easy. Siblings always fight, right? Mm, They do, but God still doesn't like criticism. Check this out. Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. Now, what is a Cushite woman? She's from Ethiopia. She's not an Israelite. She's black, all right? So listen to me. This right here tells us very clearly on just a side note, God doesn't care about color. God doesn't care about race. God cares about every individual soul. But they apparently did. They cared that their brother had now married a girl from Ethiopia. And they, at the same time, were not willing to just voice that and say, Moses, we don't agree with what you did. Rather, they begin to criticize his leadership. Check this out. It goes on to say in verse 2, they said, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? Here's what they were saying. Are you the only person who can lead all of these millions of people? I mean, are you really God's man for the hour? Why can't it be us? You know what? God has used us before too. They started getting frustrated. And obviously, this whole marriage thing was just like the tipping point of what had been brewing on the inside of them that they hadn't been saying. It had been brewing. They were frustrated like, who are you, Moses? The boy who grew up in the palace because he grew up living in the palace with the Pharaoh. If you know the story, he was found when lots of other babies were being killed off. A Pharaoh princess, Pharaoh's princess found him, took him into the palace, and he was raised until he was an adult in Pharaoh's palace. All right? So Miriam and Aaron were raised where? In the desert as slaves. So they were enslaved. Moses is this prince in the palace, and then of all people, God chooses to raise up. He raises up Moses. And so there had been this this frustration that had been brewing on the inside of them for quite some time with the position God had given their brother, all right? So it just begins to escalate. But I love this next part. It says, but the Lord heard them. You see, what's interesting is not only does God know our thoughts, so when we're critical in our mind— You might as well let it come out your mouth. I mean, you are hurting the people around you, but I'm saying as far as God, he sees it right here in your mind. But it says that the Lord heard them, and look what happens. Verse 3. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on the earth. I wonder why God chose Moses to lead those people, because he was the most humble person on the earth. He said, should it be a surprise that God appointed him to be exalted into a coveted position on the planet. See, God chose him to lead millions of people. Why? Because he was humble. It wasn't going to give him a big head. If you remember, we talked about last week in Luke 18, it says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who are humbled will be exalted. God had lifted up Moses because of his humility. Go to verse 4. So immediately, immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron and Miriam. And he said, go out to the tabernacle. That was like the church, all three of you. I love this because it's kind of like when the parent steps in and he's like, all of you right now, line it up. In my house, it was like line up and everybody's getting beat no matter who did it. You know what I'm saying? It makes no difference. We're not having a court session here. Everybody line up. Everybody's getting beat. You know the culprit is getting his or hers. I know. 
That's how that's how my family and was. The ones who got it that didn't deserve it, they did something before that you didn't know about. Exactly. So They'd be God, like, God is judge. That's how it is. Just All right. Up. So it says, so the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended. Listen to this. The Lord descended in the pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. This is a Christophany. This means Jesus himself was standing right there in the flesh, now having a conversation. Do you think that God cares about critical spirits? When he decides to come down from heaven off his throne, come and stand right in front of these three and deal with them face to face. All right? He says this. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. Now, he already knew what was going on, so he, didn't, he left Moses back. Aaron and Miriam, I want to have a conversation. They stepped forward, and the Lord said, Now you listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I can trust. Say trust. This is so good. I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. I don't bring confusion. He is sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? The Lord is very angry with him and he departs. As the cloud moved from the tabernacle, there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. So leprosy was this nasty, uh, highly contagious disease that would attack the skin, and you would break out in these nasty sores. Now, this is gross, but they would be oozing with pus and infection, and, and, you, and they would scratch at their skin. They would itch so bad like, like a nasty case of poison ivy times a thousand. They'd be oozing and itching, and it would spread, and there's nothing they could do about it. Many times they would exile these people. Because they were contagious, they were, they were uh, cast out of the towns, and they would live outside of town. They would be exiled, and many of them would live in caves out in the wilderness, and they would eventually just die. And so it was a horrible, horrible disease. And so obviously, they're in the presence of God. He's lined them up. And because of their sin, because of their critical spirits, because they, they, they questioned why Moses was being used the way that he was and criticizing his position and his decisions, God said, this, and this line just blows me away. He says, so why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? Now, when God says, you know, I've, I've, Moses is, is humble. He's the most humble person on the planet. And lo and behold, he uses him to lead millions of people to salvation and to establish a great nation. Because he was humble, God exalted him. And so God says, I, I've used my, my humble servant Moses, who I've chosen to speak with face to face. I don't talk to you guys like this, but I talk to him like this. Why were you not afraid? When I hear those words... I'm, I'm thinking to myself, God, you are so mighty. You are so powerful. And think about when we say negative things, when we criticize people of God, God's chosen people, other believers, team leads, volunteers, huh, pastors. I'm going to urge you to be very, 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 very careful. God says in his word, he says, do not touch God's anointed. David, King David, was an incredible man of character. And many, many, many times, even though Saul, King Saul, was seeking to kill David, Saul was still the anointed king, the anointed man of God. And David refused to lay a hand on him, but he also refused to say anything hurtful or negative or critical about King Saul. He always honored and elevated, lifted up King Saul, even though King Saul wasn't right. He wasn't right in his heart. He wasn't living for God. He wasn't saying the things he was supposed to say. He wasn't doing the things he was supposed to do. His leadership was crooked. He was off the charts, nutso, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, okay? But yet, David honored him. He didn't criticize him. And look what God did with David. He said, this is a man after my own heart. But yet there's times when we want to criticize people of God. Now, why is this wrong? Because what we're doing is we're judging them. And we use this phrase a lot, you know, just, just in the world, we say, hey, don't judge me, right? We like to say it, we like to throw it around, but yet it happens a lot. 
It happens all the time. When we criticize people, we're judging people. We're, we are saying, this is how I think you ought to be compared to the way you are. Okay? Listen to what Matthew says in chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. It says, do not judge so that, listen, so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. See, we tend to measure people by our intentions and judge others by their actions. We, ju- we, we, we measure ourselves, I'm sorry, by our own intentions, and we judge others by their actions. We're real easy on ourselves, and we make excuses. But when it comes to other people, there, there's, there's no tolerance whatsoever. There's, there's no mercy. There's no grace whatsoever. We don't ever seek first to understand before trying to be understood. We always just jump to conclusions and think we understand how things are. When we're critical, we're comparing what is with how we think, how we think things ought to be. And so you wonder in your mind why you haven't been promoted to, to manager or you haven't been given more job opportunities or God hasn't elevated you in some way. It could be because you're constantly and continually judging and criticizing other people around you. And God's saying, you know what? I'm the one that brings promotion. I'm the one that brings opportunity. I'm, I'm the one that lays these things out and, and hands them to you. But yet you want to keep running your mouth about how things aren't the way you think they ought to be. If you think you can do it better, I'm just going to keep you where you're at, cycling in the wilderness like the children of Israel until you learn what I'm trying to teach you. Keep your mouth shut, and he'll promote you in due season. When you make yourself low and you, and you get rid of the pride, God is going to honor you, and he's going to elevate you and lift you up. I love the story. We talked about this in a recent series, Mary and Martha. And it's worth going back just for a second. If you know the story of Mary Mary and Martha, uh, Jesus is visiting and he's in the house and uh, Mary is in the kitchen. No, I'm sorry, Martha is in the kitchen and she's cooking, she's doing dishes, she's cleaning and she's getting ready for dinner and she's setting the table. She's running around like crazy trying to get ready for everything because she's a little worker bee and she's a little OCD. She's a little perfect, perfect and that's okay because if we're OCD for G-O-D, that's the way it ought to be. I'm just saying it's okay. It's okay. Okay, it's okay to give God your very, very, very best because then he jumps in and he does the rest. We, we got to be OCD, and that's good. But Mary had a different perspective. Say perspective. She had a different viewpoint of how she should have been spending her time. See, she was over there in the dining room. She was at the feet of Jesus because God's presence was her priority. And she is anointing Jesus. She's anointing his feet. And she's worshiping him. She's honoring him. She's loving on him. And of course, you know, Marta, Marta, Marta. She, she's, she's, she's livid. She throws a fit. She's like, okay, so I don't understand something. <laughs> like, why is Mary in the dining room? Okay? Like, real. I don't know why I just went like nacho. I don't know why I did that. But, but she's, she's in the dining room. What are you doing? We got, we got dinner. We, we got to put the food on the table. There are things to do. I'm sitting here working my buns off. And you are at the feet of Jesus. What is that all about? You see, listen, Martha, she had a different perspective. In her mind, she thought she should have been working. And it's Okay. It's okay to get dinner ready. Those are all good things. Those are admirable things. But because in her mind, her perspective was that working was the thing to do, she was comparing herself to Mary. And she was judging in her mind what she thought Mary should be doing because she thought for herself working was the thing to do that Mary shouldn't be in there spending time with Jesus. And because she got caught in that curse of comparison... It caused her to become, say it with me, critical. She got critical. And she missed out. And, and here we are. Mary has now gone down in history. I mean, everybody knows who Mary is because she made God's presence her priority. She didn't get caught in that curse of comparison. She, she, didn't, she didn't get critical. She didn't judge. She just spent time with Jesus. So guess what? We're going to do another self-test. 
These are so Yay! hard. <laughs> We're going to do a self-test. Because you might be asking yourself, am I critical? I, am I? I, I don't know. I wonder if I ever judge people. Well, and you know, here, here's what is good about a self-test. Like, nobody wants the person sitting next to you who knows you so well to turn to you and be like, oh, that's you. You oh, know, you are critical. You. Hey, yes. they're, are you listening? They're talking to you. You know what I mean? Like, you want to. You want to point your finger Here, at you your my paper, family you might members. Take notes. But when you do a self-test, this is just for you. And so even as Brad and I are going down, we're like, man, these are hard. All right. Don't make eye contact with the congregation. While so we're here down. we go. How do I know if I'm critical? How do I know if I am one of those people? Here's the first thing. Does it bring you gratification to point out others' mistakes? I wrote that. Do you? <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good question. That is a good question. When I wrote it, I was, dang, that's good. That okay. is a good question. So there's a difference between <laughs> helping someone if they've asked for your opinion. There's a whole nother in spouting off just to be heard someone else's mistakes. You know, if you'll listen after today's message, you will realize this kind of stuff is happening all around us every single day. Just last night, H rode in a rodeo. He rode bulls. And as we were coming back and it was kind of late and we're kind of all scrunched in this truck and it wasn't the most comfortable thing and we're coming back and we go up to a stoplight, right? And Brad is the driver and he's the dad. That means he gets to decide how we get home. It's his decision, not the teenagers in the back seat. But as soon as he took a corner, they were like, oh, my gosh, that was so stupid. What a dumb move. Why in the world would you go this way? This is going to take us longer. And the restaurants are right down there. And he was like, what? And I immediately thought, you're being critical. Shut comparing, your mouth. Comparing you know what I mean? The decision you would have made yes, with the decision that somebody else made. Exactly. Get caught in the curse. And of I say, you know what? You can go home either way. Who's to say he's wrong in the road he just took? You need to be quiet. It's teenagers for you, but sometimes it's us. Do the next one. Number two. You are excited about this, aren't you? Because it's good. Do you oftentimes think to yourself, my way is better? Oh. Or, for that matter, I'm better. You know what I'm saying? This is tough. This is tough. Like, just move your toes back right here. You know what I mean? Oftentimes, we stand around and we see what other people are doing, especially if it's not our decision. And we stand back and we think, you know what? I got a better way. I just know it. When Brad and I were serving in churches, and we were not lead pastors. That was hard. We were worship pastors. We were kids pastors. We were teen pastors. And in all of those places. Janitors. We, yeah, janitors, we did everything. We did it all. The lawn care, we've done everything. When we would go in and sit in boardrooms with people, we would think to ourselves, boy, that is not how I would do it. I have some stories. Uh, we don't have time. That is not how I would do it. And we would think to ourselves, I could do it better. My plan is better. But you know what one day God decided to do? Have us plant a church. And then we were the ones making the decisions and having other people now look at us. Now we get to make all the decisions. And so we know what's going on in your minds when we cancel church, right? Because the storms are coming and then the sun Well, that pops, was a stupid right? decision. And we cancel. And you're like, boy, that was dumb. Who canceled Obviously, Walkers tonight? Obviously, the you know sun know what I'm is saying? shining. <laughs> and you're like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to make the decision, own it. And live with it. But the rest of us get critical because guess what? That decision didn't lay on That's your shoulder. That's not the decision I would have made. No. I would have, I'm smart. I would, be, I would have known the weather was going to change and the sun was going to pop by 7 o'clock. Not a All right, August. number three. Do you allow yourself to get irritated at the way things are being done <laughs> or the way people operate in your circle? <gasps> this is tough. This is tough. I wrote all these. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Because we've dealt with it. All right, number four and the last one. Do you ever come up with an excuse as to why someone is more successful than you? You know what? If I would have had the opportunity they had, I'd be where they are. If, if I wouldn't have had these junk things happen in my life, if I would have grown up in a different home, if I would have had parents who really cared, if I'd have had people supporting me and had that support system, I'd be where they are too. But you know what? You know where that leaves us? miserable miserable when you choose to be critical you are making yourself and everyone around you absolutely 
Miserable. So you're either having these thoughts and you're thinking these things, which is judgmental and critical, but most of the time, you know how it manifests? Set our mouth. <laughs> right there. <laughs> and we share it with other people and it, it transforms from criticism to gossip. Yeah. That's what happens. Well, because we're not going because straight to you. It's and saying, not fun hey, if Pastor I'm the only Brad. one at my pity party. i got to invite somebody. Hey, Pastor Brad, you know I what? Can't... I've got an idea that I think we could make something better. We're not doing that. We're going over here and be like, you know what? You know what I think pastors ought to do? You know what I think my husband ought to do? You know what I think my wife ought to do? You know what I think my boss ought to do? Rather than going right to them and yeah. having a conversation Rather than to go to the source right here. and talk about it. You want exactly to talk to right. other people about it, which get, has exactly. never produced anything good ever. No, ever. It's never produced anything good right. because they're not the one solving the problems. That's right. They can't you do anything problem, about it. All you're doing work. is you, you are feeding this 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 psycho trip. I don't know what it is. A psychological like a joy that you get yeah. out of just running your mouth. Yeah. And so I wrote some other examples that I thought I might share with you this morning because <sighs> this is really good. I'm just saying. A lot of times we have these thoughts within ourselves, but a lot of times we share these things out loud. So, uh, well, I would look that good, too, if I lived on a treadmill. <laughs> Ladies, uh, you've probably said this, some of us actually have to work and take care of our kids, you know. We have kids to raise, and we have to work for a living. So um, everyone, every, everyone knows uh, good and well that they can't afford that kind of car. Thank God for loans, though. I'm sure they're living in debt up to their eyeballs. Well, yeah, they're... <laughs> Well, yeah, their house is nice. You know he's in construction. He did most of the work himself. Otherwise, there's no way they would be able to live in a house like that. <laughs> well, if I would have had the same opportunities in life, I'd be doing just as good as they are. You know, the only reason she got that promotion is probably because she's sleeping with the boss. Wow. Wow. I'm just saying. Wow. Wow. That's you. Quit doing it. All right. <laughs> well, oh, here's a good one. This happens a lot. People go into like, like, they're, they're so, uh, they feel so inferior or so threatened by other people's success. This is what they say. I don't want what they have, right? They work around the clock. I actually want to have a life, thank you very much. They start making excuses and say, well, you know what? They might have it good, but I don't, I don't think what they have is good. And then, oh, does this happen? Do you know, do you know where I'm living right now? Do you know what I'm saying? We, we slip into this critical, poisonous behavior. Here's what James says. Do not complain against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. We've said this before. This is a quote by the amazing Billy Graham, who I can't wait to spend time with in heaven. And he said this. He said, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict our hearts. It's God's job to judge. It's our job to love. We're going to go quickly, very quickly through, some, and I, I truly want you to take notes, okay, in this last part, because this is going to help you, really, to reverse this curse of comparison and to snap out of this mindset of being critical, because let me tell you why. It, it'll ruin your family. It will ruin your, your, your career, your work culture. It will, any culture, okay, a culture is anywhere there's more than one person, and it's the way things are. That's what the culture is, okay? So you have a family culture. You have a work culture. Anywhere you go where there's people, there's a culture. And I'm telling you, having a critical spirit will destroy. It will be poisonous and toxic to any culture you are in. And if you're critical, you are the problem. Don't be a part of the problem. Be a part of the solution. All right, go ahead. So the motives behind a critical spirit are this, all right? You need to understand this. It's jealousy, fear, Envy, anger, pride. hatred, control, which are all pride issues, all right? They're driven by pride. So this morning, as we're wrapping up, I just want to tell you the antidote, and this is what I myself have had to learn to put into place in order to overcome. And, and do those thoughts still pop into your head? Every day. Every day. But you don't have to meditate on them, and you sure don't have to let them come out of your mouth. All right? You deal with it in your own spirit before you affect other people around you. The first one is this, spending quality and adequate time in God's presence. We're not talking about just reading God's word just to say you read it, listening to you version just because you know that other people can see whether you've done it or not. We're talking about spending real quality time in God's presence. Why? Because when you get in God's presence, your perspective changes. 
all of a sudden I start looking at other people and saying, you know what? Maybe there was a reason today that they didn't perform at their very best. Maybe there's something going on at home. Maybe before I judge and criticize, I should try to figure out what's going on in their life. And maybe I should wrap them up and love on them a little bit rather than standing back and judging them. Being in the presence of God changes things. It changes it everything. Changes. You could just do that and it would change everything. I can promise you, if you're dealing with a critical spirit right now, you've not been in the presence of God long yeah. enough. It and I've it. seen people, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Okay, that's her. I've seen people spend time in the presence of God, like really like, and their attitude and everything changes. Honestly, when I was 16 years old and I completely surrendered my life to Jesus, I made a commitment that year to get up at 5 a.m., That started a trend for me the rest of my life. But I got up at 5 a.m. and from 5 to 6, I spent one hour as a 16-year-old reading my Bible and praying. It changed everything on the inside of me. It changed my attitude, and it caused me to have love towards God's people. The second thing you have to do, once you've done that, that's not a cure-all, all right? Then you have to do this. You have to take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. Every time a thought pops in your head that is negative about the situation, that is negative about someone else, you have to say, you know what? God, this isn't a God-honoring thought. It has to go. And then pray for that person. If you've got a boss that's driving you nuts, pray for them. Don't stand around being negative and complaining because you know what? It's not going to get you anywhere. Be a part of the solution. Pray for them. And number three is this. Build up instead of tear down. Honor elevates every single time. Humility makes low honor elevates. When you begin to honor other people and you begin to elevate them, God will see that and God will begin to bless you. God will begin to change your circumstances, but you've got to do it. Get into God's presence. Take every thought captive and build up. That's what King David did and God blessed him for it. Anytime Misty and I see people, they're like, man, golly, where we're tempted to really compare ourselves, you know what we do? We compliment the fire out of them. That's right. We're like, that is awesome. Celebrate that with is. Them. We celebrate other people's success. That's right. We build them up. We compliment. We That's lift right. them up. And God makes us low, which is exactly where yeah. he wants us all to be. Let's Amen. pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray a reverse of the curse of comparison in our lives. God, we pray that you would wipe away pride, that we wouldn't compare ourselves to others, that we wouldn't have a critical spirit, God. Help us, Lord, to to seek first to understand and to not always be heard, to not need to be heard and give our opinions and and just and try to to push the way we think onto other people, God. Don't don't allow us to get into that nasty mindset of judging other people in situations, God. Humble us. Keep us low. We pray, God, that we would be used by you in a mighty way because of our humility. We love you, Father God. We thank you with heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you in this place and you want a real relationship with Jesus? You want to make heaven your home? I want to tell you, he is knocking on your heart's door. And what you have to do is admit, like I did many years ago, that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Confess Jesus as Lord of your life and commit today that you're going to live for him. With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you make that decision today? Is that you? On this rainy day, Is that you today? If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I want to know who I'm praying with this morning. Jesus. Church, let's pray this prayer together, shall we? Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I confess Jesus as Lord of my life. He is the Son of God. Help me to reverse the curse of comparison. Help me to not be critical. Help me to honor others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with us today, we want to, we want to celebrate by giving you a gift called our Next Step Kit. You can pick it up on the left as you exit today. This morning, will you just put your hands together and let's just celebrate those lives that are being changed. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 
Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.